where your head at? Dang, don't wanna talk business, business. I guess I gotta be the one to see the summer. Who really in this, in this? We so fed up. My life, 10 up. Yo, time, been up. Big prayers, sent up. Uh, couldn't do without him, out him. Uh, glad that I found him, found him. Uh, crowd really wild, wild. Uh, I'm kicking it, shallow, shallow. Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Pastor Armando, and I am super excited and pumped to be here with you today. We are in the second part of our message series entitled Chasing Carrots. And if you were with us last week, uh, man, we had an awesome message, and we came to understand that Chasing Carrots is really about us uh, in the endless pursuit of things that are just out of our reach. Uh, we pursue things that we can never grab hold of. And chasing carrots goes back to uh, kind of an ancient practice uh, or an old practice where they would dangle a carrot or some sort of uh, item that an animal wanted to eat, such as a horse or a mule or a donkey. And if that animal was stubborn and wouldn't walk, they would literally dangle that carrot or that item in front of them and it would keep the animal walking, but he would never actually grab hold of it because if he did, he'd stop walking, right? So, so so many of us pursue in life things that we will never actually grab hold of. We pursue fame. Man, you can never be famous enough. We pursue money. There can never be enough money. We pursue uh, the validation, the love, the acceptance of people. You will never maintain that very long because it's situational. People only love and validate you when you give them what they want. Why? Because people are broken and sinful. And uh, man, we pursue that and we pursue better jobs and more comfortable homes. We pursue comfort and it never lasts very long. We are literally living on the hamster wheel of life. We're just going in one direction over and over and over, spinning our wheels. Some of us are frustrated today because we've been there. We've had the bigger home. We've had the expensive car and we, we've bought this or we bought that and, and, and it never satisfied the broken hole deep within our souls. And for many of us, the source of your greatest frustration is actually the wrong things you and I pursue. The source of your greatest frustration are the wrong things that you and I pursue in this life. And today we are going to talk about the endless pursuit of perfection. That's right. Many of us today struggle with perfectionism. And I would actually venture to say this. All of us have tangled with this demon at one point or another. And, and, and we go on two extremes, right? Some of us experience the pressure to perform. Uh, we experience that pressure and we don't want to let people down and we don't want to fail people and we don't man, we don't want to be seen as inadequate. So we go on this extreme, which is, man, I got to, man, I got to do everything perfect. I got to do everything right. And it's driven by fears and inadequacy. Some of us are like, man, I will never measure up. And we fall into despair and we go on the other extreme. And if you've ever heard yourself say this, man, I don't care what they think. I don't care what they say about me, man. They, what, what they think has no impact on me. One, we're lying because words do hurt. And two, it's because we've dealt with the demon of perfectionism and it has hurt us and we've walked away. And the reason why I call it a demon today is because it's something very painful in our lives. It's something that has caused many of us to experience wounds deep within our souls. Uh, many of us are wounded today because someone told you you weren't good enough. Many of you are wounded today because somebody told you you were not attractive enough. You were not smart enough. You would never, ever make it. Some of us are wounded today simply because we believe we don't measure up. And, and, and this life that we're in, the pressure to prove is real. How many of you know that everyone wants something from you? Man, when I was a, a, a younger father, right, I have four kids and they're all older now. But when I was younger, I remember coming home from work and the moment that key went in the doorknob, I heard daddy's home and it was magical and it was awesome. And I would get hugs at the door and the dog would greet me. Uh, and then about 10 seconds later, daddy, can you get this? Daddy, can you do this? Daddy, can you play with me? Man, daddy, can you uh, fix this? And then my wife from the kitchen, hi, honey, welcome home. Can you get the dishes on the, in the top of the cabinet here? And my, my head spun. And I would often just run upstairs to my room, get in the shower, cool off, prepare myself for being wanted and needed all night after a long day at work. And that's not to ignore my poor wife. My poor wife was like, yes, my husband's coming home. And that's going to be my reprieve. That's going to be my break. Man, all day long, my four wonderful children have wanted did something from me. They have pulled at me. They have distracted me. They have stopped me in my tracks from whatever it was I was doing because they want something from me nonstop. The pressure to perform is real. 
And I want you guys to navigate with me into a moment in Jesus' life. There's a moment in his life that was a very human, human moment. Many of us, when we think about Jesus, all we think about is he is God. He's a second member of the Trinity, the Lord and Savior of my life. And that's all true. But he was also 100% man, 100% God, 100% man. And there's this moment in scripture that was a really human moment that gave us a snippet of the pressures that Jesus lived under, the pressure to perform. And that is the title of today's message, the pressure to perform. And, and Jesus was under that, not just by people around him, but also by his own family. So, so here's a moment in history uh, chapter 6 of, uh, of John, Jesus is teaching about communion. And he's teaching a group of people that, uh, about communion and that uh, sacrament, some of you call it, or that ordinance, as we call it, that Jesus asked us to partake in. Um, he's teaching about that, but they misunderstood that he meant it figuratively, that he meant that he would fulfill prophecy, that he meant that his body would hang on the cross and his, and his blood would, would run and, and that would be the blood of the new covenant. They somehow missed it and thought Jesus was signing them up for cannibalism. And Jesus said things like, man, you have to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And they're like, that's a nope. That is not what I want. And they turned their backs and walked away. When Jesus was like, man, you have to drink of my blood. They were like, that's not me. I ain't doing that. This guy is crazy. And, and scripture shows us that all of them, except for the 12, deserted Jesus. Because they didn't wait for the punchline, because they never waited for the explanation, in that moment, they heard Jesus at a time without the fullness of context, and they turned their back on Jesus. Could you imagine that? The world Jesus lived in is no different than the world today. What you and I have to realize is the world has insatiable appetites for perfection. Even Jesus did not measure up to what the world wanted. God, who is perfect in every way, never measured up to the broken expectations of this world. And we're using the, wor the word world, but who's in the world? It's people. And what we have to realize is the people you and I serve, the people, and I say serve because the people you and I want love, affection, validation, affirmation, all these things from, they are broken people just like you and I. And their appetite is insatiable. People will accept you. People will love you so long as you are playing the part. So long as you are doing what they want you to do. So long as you are serving them, their needs, their wants, their desires. But the moment you don't fit the picture, the moment that they're like, man, you're not doing what I want, in that moment they reject you. It's like your whole history of compliance, your whole history of love, your whole history of servanthood is erased and in that moment you're bad. And that's what the world did to Jesus. The world required of Jesus an expectation of their idea of perfection. And when he didn't fill it, they rejected him. And that is the pressure you and I are in, in this world. Some of us are hurt. Some of us are deeply wounded by that pressure of perfection. But guys, it's a hoax because you will never measure up. You will never measure up to the unrealistic, broken expectations of other people. However, there is a way you and I can measure up to God. There is a way you and I can be made holy and righteous, be seen as perfect, and it is through the cross, it is through the work of Jesus Christ that he did for you and I. So after these folks rejected him, Scripture says, after this, Jesus went around in Galilee. That's John 7, verse 1. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders uh, were there and they were looking for a way to kill him. Verse 2. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the works you do. How many of you know that there's always someone in your life that thinks they know what's best for you? How many of you know that there's always someone in your life, and you know this if you have siblings, that always think that what they want for you is better than what you want? And that's the real moment Jesus is in. He's just been kicked in the stomach by life. People have just turned their back on him. They've walked away, and his brothers are like, Jesus, you know what? We know what's best for you. And, and Jesus, man, could you imagine God uh, infinite knowledge. He knows everything is being told what to do by his brothers. Guys, siblings will never change. Siblings 2,000 years ago are the same of siblings today. So they knew what was best for Jesus. Verse 4 goes on. Uh, no one who wants to become public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world, Jesus. You can almost hear them picking at him, poking at him, prodding at him, trying to provoke him to anger. Verse 5 says, 
for even his own brothers did not believe in him. What you and I have to realize is sometimes the people closest to us are the people that hurt us most. Sometimes it's the people closest to us that will turn their back on us. It's the people closest to us that will reject us. It's oftentimes the people closest to us who have put us in a position that we think we need to live in a place of perfection, living up to their wants, their needs, their desires, so that we will not be rejected, so that we will not be um, uh, unloved, so that we will not be seen as unvaluable. It's often those closest relationships where we have let down. So Jesus's brothers did not believe in him. They're provoking him to anger. And then verse six, therefore Jesus told them, my time is not yet here, but for you, any time is good. Man, salty Jesus, right? He got a little salty here. And he's like, man, for you, any time is good. But man, I don't have to prove myself to you. Jesus is like, man, do you know who I am? Clearly you don't, but you will find out. Man, for you, you have to realize you don't have to prove yourself to anybody. People may think they know what's best for you, but they don't know what's best for you. Only God himself knows what's best for you. Man, and you have to realize that what the world can't do for you, God can. The world asks you to perform to be loved. The world asks you to give them what they want for you to be validated. With God, it comes free of charge. The problem is you and I are trying to be loved and validated by all these broken people who don't even love and validate themselves. But then there's God. God gives it freely and completely. So the story goes on. The brothers go to the festival. Jesus goes in secret and the crowd is talking. Some people are like, man, Jesus, is he here? I heard he's healing the sick. Man, I, I heard Jesus is raising the dead. Man, I heard he's walking on water. And then there's others that are like, man, he's a false teacher. Man, he's leading the people astray. Don't follow Jesus. You're going to get in trouble. And then there's the Pharisees that are plotting to kill him. Jesus knew that the pressure to prove was real. So many of you are there at that place today. You're struggling with your family. You're struggling with friends, people around you who expect you and I to be perfect. The problem is it's impossible to have peace if the expectation on your life is perfection, whether it's from others or you're a perfectionist and it's from yourself. Sometimes in life, the biggest blocker to you living a blessed life is your need to be perfect. Being a perfectionist is like having a never-ending report card, a never-ending scorecard where you have to be good enough and then you have a life where you have to maintain it moment after moment after moment. You can't have a letdown. You can't have a setback. You can't have a human moment. You have to keep everyone, including yourself, happy at every given moment. Guys, it's an exhausting life. Some of you are stressed out today because of the rat race you live in. Some of us are stressed out today because the world or even yourself expects you to be perfect. You see, perfectionism, perfectionism is birthed in pain. It's birthed in, in brokenness. Perfectionism as a child starts with a desire to stand out, a desire to be loved, a desire to be valued, a desire to be noticed, a desire to be celebrated, a desire to be paid attention to. That is the origin of, of where brokenness happens. That's the origin where we feel unloved and devalued by parents and people in our lives. And really what perfectionism is about, it's about two things. It's about avoiding failure and letting others down. About avoiding failure and letting others down. And it's something all of us struggle with. On one extreme, man, I want to make everybody happy, or the other, man, I don't care what people think because I've given up on the rat race. But really that is not a place of healing, folks. That's a place of despair. Healing is where we stand in, in the presence of God and we say, I'm a son of God or a daughter of God and I don't have to perform to be valuable. I don't have to perform to be loved or liked. God loves me. God values me. God is for me. And the world, if they don't accept me the way I am, it says more about their own brokenness than mine. The root of brokenness is in the fear of never being enough. And for us, we have to understand that there's three types of perfectionists. Three types of perfectionists. There is the self-oriented perfectionist. That's the person who puts unrealistic expectations of perfection on themselves. And they are left feeling uh, high, high, high battles of guilt and shame and that they never measure up. They always live life feeling like they have to perform because if they don't, they deal with shame and guilt. And even when they do a good job, it's never good enough and they always second guess it. 
Number two is externally oriented perfectionists, the externally oriented perfectionists. They believe that other people have expectations upon them that they must be perfect. My parents, they want me to be perfect. My teachers want me to be perfect. My church wants me to be perfect. My, uh, my spouse wants me to be perfect. And the outcome for them is they feel alone. They feel isolated. If, if you've ever sat there and thought to yourself, man, I feel like nobody knows me. I feel like nobody sees me. I feel like people don't don't understand who I really am. It's probably because you are an externally oriented perfectionist. You may not feel like you need to be a perfectionist, but you feel like others have all these wants over you. Then there's the other uh, or others oriented perfectionist. That would be the person who has expectations that other people need to be perfect and other people need to live up to your wants, expectations, and needs. And that can come across as arrogance or narcissism. But the outcome there is this. If I put others down, if I see others as not being enough, it elevates me. When others are down and out, I feel like I'm doing okay. And that in and of itself as well is perfectionist. Man, I, I know the story of this woman when she was a little girl. Um, the weapon of comparison did a lot of damage to her. See, many of us struggle with perfectionism on one extreme or the other today because of seeds that were sown at a very young age. And this is what it looked like for this little girl. If she got a 95 on a test, her parents were like, what about the other five? Ooh, that stung, right? If she did, got an award at school, they were like, well, why'd you only get one award? Ugh, that stung. When she was number two in her class, people made the comment, well, I wonder what it feels like to be number one. It's, oh, that hurt. These are wounds of the ego. These are wounds of the heart. These are wounds of the soul. You're not good enough. You're not valuable enough. You can't measure up. And it was the power of comparison that led to perfectionism. Because what is the power? It leaves you feeling less than, so you have to perform in life. Or it raises the bar so high, and if you're lucky enough to reach that bar, you will spend the rest of your life on that hamster wheel trying to maintain it. It's a rat race that will leave you busted, disgusted, and hurt, and you will never know as a perfectionist unconditional love. And that's true. The perfectionist has no clue about unconditional love because they believe that love, accepted validation is only given when they reach a certain mark. But that's not the economy of God, guys. That's not the church. That's not how the Bible says we ought to live our lives. What we have to come to understand is that there's two economies the world says you are valuable and worth something if you succeed. What does that mean? In the eyes of who? The world says you are valuable and worth something if you've accomplished something. Accomplished what? Who defines that? Who defines that? God says you are made in my image, thus you don't have to do anything. You are made in my image. I chose you. I love you. I'm for you. There is nothing you have to do to gain my love, my, my, my valuing of you. There's nothing you need to do to gain my acceptance. It is through Christ Jesus and it is free of charge. And once you have it, you don't have to work hard to maintain it. He has done the work. The maintenance is in Christ as your high priest, as it says in Hebrews. It is not based on your efforts. It is not based on what you do. Guys, perfectionism is a hoax. Give it up. You are not perfect. You will never be perfect. Even if you measure up to some faulty standard that's set by some broken person, you will let them down and they will turn their back on you. Guys, walk away from a life of perfectionism from this extreme to this, to this extreme. The outcome is birthed in pain and the outcome and the, let me say this, the origin is birthed in pain. That's where the root is. But the outcome is a life of stress. So many of us are living lives of stress and anxiety. You have a good life, but you don't know how to celebrate it. You have a lot in your life and you don't know how to appreciate it. For some of us, the reason why we struggle with our heart of thanksgiving is because nothing is ever enough. And it's never enough because nothing's good enough. Why? Because I'm a perfectionist. How do you know you're a perfectionist? How do you know? Nothing and no one is ever good enough. You don't take compliments well, and maybe you don't give them either. You look down on others. You look down on yourself. You struggle with guilt and shame. You get easily offended. You struggle with procrastination. That's right. A perfectionist struggles with procrastination. Why? Fear of failure. Fear of letting people down. You, feel, you fear failure. You feel you are smarter than others. 
or on the other extreme, you feel like others are smarter than you. Maybe you monopolize conversations. It always has to be about you. And I'll throw this in there. You find fault in everyone and everything. That is the heart of a perfectionist. The outcome of perfectionism, guys, hold on to this. I know this is hitting home for some of you. The outcome of perfectionism is self-hatred and hatred of others. So much so, let's look at some statistics. As I was working on this message, you guys have no idea how much material and content that, that I discover, and only a small portion of that is, is shared in a 40-minute message. But let's go over some stats, and I, and I really chose to focus in on stats that pertain to girls because they were so startling. Perfectionism impacts everyone, but the statistics that it has on women and little girls was profoundly disturbing. Let me read this to you. Seven in 10 girls under 18 believe they are not good enough. Seven in 10 under 18 believe they don't measure up, believe that they're, they're not as valuable as others. Seven in 10. 74% of girls say that they feel like they have to please everyone. That's almost three quarters of young ladies feel like they have to keep everybody happy all the time. Who wants to live under that curse? 98% of girls feel an immense pressure to look a certain way. 90%, not 98, forgive me, 98% of girls and women feel an external pressure to look a certain way. Man, I am sorry, ladies and, and young girls, on behalf of society, it is, the, it is this need for perfection, this endless rat race, this pursuit of exhaustion of perfection that has led to this. You are enough. You don't have to look like someone else. You don't have to be like someone else. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, Scripture says. You are more than enough in Christ. Don't ever let that lie uh, soak deep into your soul to think that you are inadequate. You are who you are because God made you that way. You need to sit and trust in that. One in four girls are diagnosed with a mental health disorder. One in four, depression, anxiety, cutting, just to mention a few. In all of these, the origin of, of many of them is self-rejection, self-hatred. I'm not enough. I'm not good enough. By the age of 13, 53% of American girls are unhappy with their bodies. <laughs> By age 17, that raises to 78%. Guys, this is not God's plan for your life. It is not God's desire. The, the, these statistics are, are relevant of a lie spoken into us by a broken society that's representative. And when we say society, what we're really talking about is all the people around us, broken expectations, wounded people who are not happy. And these are the people that we're trying to please. These are the people we're trying to live up to their standards. They have insatiable appetites that you and I can't feed and should not feed. Their brokenness, just like yours and mine, needs to be brought to the foot of the cross. The Bible says God shows no partiality. The Bible shows us there is no favoritism in God. And yet here we have an economy where the world says you're only worth it if you look the part, if you play the part, and you can accomplish something. But God says, oh no, you're worth it because I say you are. You don't have to perform. You don't have to earn it. Man, I give it to you free of charge. And then the devil has a plan for you. Hold on to this. If you're a follower of Jesus, you need to know this. And if you're not a follower of Jesus today, but you're tuning into this message, man, I want to speak something that I think is going to resonate with you. There is an enemy of your soul called the devil, called Lucifer. And his desire, he cannot take away your salvation in Christ. When you become a new creation, bought and paid for by Christ Jesus, you're in the family of God. But his desire is to tarnish and break the image of God that you're made in. Your perspective of that is if the devil can jam you up feeling like you're less than, you're not good enough, you're not worthy enough, what gets stolen from you is your belief and your ability to serve God. The Holy Spirit may be in you. The Holy Spirit may be doing his work to prepare you for the work of ministry, to live a bold and powerful life in Christ. But when you're not believing you're good enough, when you're not believing you're smart enough, when you don't think you're capable enough, you never step out in faith and take a risk because you serve fear as your God. And that is the secondary attack on the life of of a human being that the enemy has. The first is he tries to keep you from a relationship with God through a veil, through a covering, where it's hard for us to see the truth of Jesus. But when we break through that, when the Holy Spirit reveals that to us and that curtain is pulled away and we become children of the Most High God, then the devil attacks your identity. 
And it starts from infancy. It starts from a young age. Jeremiah 17.5 says this. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in a man. Cursed is the person who is a people pleaser. Cursed is the person who looks for their love, their affirmation, their validation in the hands of a human being. Cursed is the one who looks for others to give them worth and value. Then it goes on. Who draws strength from the flesh? Cursed is the one who trusts in man who draws strength from the flesh. There, if you guys could fix the brokenness of your emotions, if you and I could fix the brokenness of our self-esteem, our worth, our value, it would be done already. The problem is we can't fix it. Only God can. And the outcome is this. And whose heart turns away from the Lord. So the outcome is when we trust in man, right? Trust in others. And then we put our hope in our own flesh, our own abilities. The outcome is we find ourselves far away from God. We find ourselves way far from God, out from underneath the covering of his perfection. Why? Because you thought you could do it in your own strength. You thought because you measured up without Jesus, the world will leave you busted, disgusted, and rejected. The world is going to turn its back on you like it did Jesus. What makes you think you're going to get more than Jesus got? We don't, but God receives you. God loves you just as you are. Guys, I don't want to live a cursed life. Check out this point. Perfectionism in many ways can be sin because it's an attempt to bypass what only Jesus can do for you and to seek self-value in your own strength and ability. I'm going to read that again. Perfectionism in many ways can be sin because it's an attempt to bypass what only Jesus can do for you and to seek self-value in your own strength and ability. And that's what the beauty of the gospel is. The beauty of the gospel is that Jesus meets you where you're at, in your brokenness, in your emptiness, and you can't earn right relationship with God. You can't earn uh, all those things that you and I desire, those things we seek, but they are freely given to you by God. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by their works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Understand this. The Bible's very clear. You cannot earn what you seek. You can't work for it. You can't make it happen. We're not smart enough. We're not good enough. We cannot. Your, your pursuit of perfectionism will only end in hatred of self and others. But until you see yourself as a sinner, you will never see your need for, as, for a savior. Until you see your need uh, 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 until you see yourself as a sinner, until you see yourself as broken, you will never see your need uh, for a savior. You see, your brokenness in mind should point to the cross, not toward perfectionism, not toward that rat race, not toward that hamster wheel, not toward that thing that is going to hurt us, but toward the cross. Because Ephesians 2, 8, 10 says this, for it, is by, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no man should boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Understand, guys, the Bible's clear. For it has been by grace you have been saved through faith. It's through your belief that God, your belief in Jesus, that God gives you grace, that which you don't deserve. God gives you what you and I don't deserve, his love, his mercy, his grace, his full and complete acceptance. And it's not by works. You didn't earn it. You can't maintain it. You are God's handiwork. I don't know what the world told you. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not attractive enough. God is telling you, you are my handiwork. You are the work of my hands. I have sculpted you beautifully and wonderfully. You are fearfully made. Man, you are my handiwork. I am pleased with what I see. I am pleased with what I birth. No lie from the devil could steal that. No lie from your parents can steal that. And I prepared you for a work. You have a purpose. You have not accomplished anything in this world that this world wants you to accomplish but I am telling you I have created you for a purpose for a future and it's going to require two things from you guys it's going to require rejecting a lie and accepting truth you know what I do when when I'm struggling with a thought low self-esteem, validation, when I'm struggling with this need to measure up to be enough, this need for perfection Man, I correct it by understanding, man, what what does the Bible say about this thing I'm struggling with? What is a truth that I can apply to my life? Man, I open up the book and I encourage you to do the same thing and identify for yourself what does the Bible, truth, say in opposition to what you have been told about you, the lie, and then you replace it. 
And that brings life to my soul because any act of perfectionism is failure to remember the gospel. Remember that, guys. Any act of perfectionism is failure to remember the gospel. So the big question is, how do I get out of this rat race? How do I... How do I depart from the hamster wheel? Okay, Pastor, you've done a great job. You've told us why perfectionism is bad. You've helped me to see it in my own life. You've showed us statistics on the outcome it has on people. It's bad. It's no good. I ain't about that. Man, I don't want that. So what do I need to do? You and I, we need to hang out with Jesus. Man, that sounds so simple, but I want to share with you the tale of two women. Jesus is your recovery program from perfectionism. The tale of two women. So there's this two sisters, Mary and Martha, Luke 10, 38 to 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Man, how many of you know that Mary had the best seat in the house? Mary understood, man, I'm going to, this is Jesus, man. He's the guy who heals the sick, brings life to the dead, sight to the blind, ears to the, to the deaf. Man, he is the answer. He's the son of God. I'm going to position myself at his feet, best seat in the house. Because he accepts me. I don't need to perform to be accepted by Jesus. I don't need a ticket to get into that room. I don't need to uh, win lotto to be lucky with him. It's not about chance. It's about love. Freely and accepted are you and was Mary. But Martha, man, I got to earn it. See, Mary and Martha had two different perspectives. Mary's like, man, I'm going to sit at his feet. He loves me and accepts me the way I am. I don't have to do anything to sit at the table of Jesus. But Martha, she's like, I got to earn it. All my life, I felt like I wasn't good enough. All my life, I felt like I didn't measure up. All my life, people only validated me by the type of hospitality I could provide. And I know my culture demands a woman to look a certain way. My culture demands a woman to act a certain way. Mary wasn't about that. But Martha, man, she was programmed. She was programmed for pain. She was programmed for lies. And, and Mary wasn't. But so many of us today are programmed wrong. We're buying into the things our society says as opposed to the things that the word of God says. But, but Mary understood, man, if I am around Jesus, if I hang out with Jesus, if I seek first the kingdom of God, everything else will be given to me. What you have to realize is if you want your pain, your wounds, your, your, your baggage in life to be healed, it's going to come through seeking the kingdom of God first. And all of that, knowing who God is, knowing who Jesus is in your life, will bring healing to your pains and wounds. Man, I hung out with Jesus. He changed my life. I was a street kid who made a lot of bad decisions, but when I met the Lord, I got saved. But how many of you know I still had baggage in my life? I went through life for so many years feeling like I wasn't smart enough, capable enough, good enough. You know what? Truth let me off the hook. I'm not. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not capable enough. And you know what? That's good news. Why? Because that act of humility opened my heart to Jesus. It opened my heart to the gospel. Now I'm saved by grace, a sinner saved by grace. The Holy Spirit's in my life. And now God is using me as a vessel and a tool to do some cool and awesome things. And it's not me. It's Jesus through my life. I am made enough in Christ. God has redeemed that which he has given me that has fallen into sin. I am created in the image of God just like you. And it fell into sin. It was tarnished. It was marred. It was stained. And a life, a relationship with Jesus redeems that back to right standing with God. I am enough today because Jesus said I am enough. I'm enough today because of what his word says. Man, I have adopted a Mary mindset and not a Martha mindset. Verse 40, but Martha was distracted. Say distracted. You can write it in the chat. By all the preparations that had to be made. Some of you are distracted today. You're distracted from God. You're distracted from truth. You're distracted because you believe that it's going to be by your hand that you get better, that you believe it's going to be by your hand that you're going to measure up, that you're going to be good enough, that it's going to be by your hand. You're distracted because you're, you're worried about keeping all these people happy. Guys, forget them. They cannot Guys, they can't be happy. Neither could you and I. We are broken people. No matter how much you serve them, no matter how much you do for them, they will all turn their backs on you because they're broken. They are no different than us. Human beings are seekers of comfort, and we seek comfort after comfort after comfort. Why? Because we're not happy. 
We are broken. We're not happy in life. We are never satisfied. But the Bible says that there's a joy in Christ we can come to know that circumstances can't steal from you. Happiness is a feeling that's like the wind. This world, all the people around you, if they don't know Jesus, all they have is a pursuit of happiness. But I know Jesus. Many of you know Jesus. I don't pursue happiness anymore. When it comes, great. Man, but I have joy. Joy given to me by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I don't have to maintain it. It's in me. I'm content. I'm content. And I don't have to be distracted, but some of us are distracted because we're trying to keep them happy. You're trying to keep your parents happy. Man, every time you accomplish something, hey, mom and dad, guess what I did? Uh, or Facebook, hey, everybody, look what I did. Please give me validation. Please give me acceptance. Please give me love. Man, you know what? Man, I challenge some of you. Next time you accomplish something big, tell no one. Leave it between you and God. Feel the comfort of his love, his grace, his mercy. Don't have a Martha perspective. Have a Mary perspective because the pressure to prove is real. Martha was distracted because she didn't feel like she measured up. She wasn't enough. She found value in what she did, not who she was in Christ. And that's the problem with many of us. We find too much value in the things we do and too little value in who we are in Christ. And that's what I want to challenge you guys to do today. So she came to him, Martha, and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. You see, guys, you're going to love this one. Unspoken expectations are premeditated resentments. Unspoken expectations are premeditated resentments. Man, Martha had some serious expectations on Jesus. In her brokenness, she thought there was a right way. Tell Mary to get away from your feet and tell her her value is what she does, not who she is. God tells you, his economy, that God's value of you is in who you are, not what you do, for he is not a respecter of men, but the world tells you that the value is in what you do, not who you are. The world rejects you. It doesn't reject the things that they want you to accomplish. So expectations led her to be let down, hating herself and being angry at her sister. She said to Jesus, don't you care? Let me tell you this. Sometimes we go to God complaining and we pray prayers, but the reality is we have either co-created or created our own misery. Martha was distracted because she was living in the lies that she had been told all her life. She found value in what she does, not who she is. And, and she was holding herself, as many of you and I do, to standards not even God places upon you. And that's the heart of perfectionism. God does not expect you to be perfect. Some of us today feel guilt and shame because, man, we got to be the right Christian. we got to be that Christian. And so many of us fall short. God doesn't expect you to be a perfect Christian. If you could be perfect, there would be no need for Jesus. If you could measure up, there would be no need for Jesus. If you could accomplish things in your own strength, there would be no need for Jesus. Because the Bible says, he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. The Bible tells us in Philippians that, man, that, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. You cannot do anything on your own. Everything you have is a gift from God. But look at Jesus' gracious reply. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. You see, Jesus is saying that to you today. He's calling out you by name. You are upset you are distracted. You are worried about many things, many of the wrong things, and you're hurting yourself. Stop it. Jesus is telling you that he needs you to let it go. He wants you to let it go. The gift of his grace is mercy. It's there. The Holy Spirit is there. But God is saying, let it go. You don't have to work for acceptance anymore. You don't have to try hard for validation anymore. You are validated. You are affirmed. You are valued by God. There is nothing you need to accomplish. Get off the hamster wheel. Stop exhausting yourself. So many of you are tired today because of the rat race, the never-ending report card, that never-ending scorecard. Jesus is saying, throw it away, Martha. Throw it away. He's calling you out by name. Throw it away. Don't be about that anymore. Be about what is true, what is just, what is right, what is holy. God accepts you right where you're at. God values you and the church values you, not on what you do, but who you are. Verse 42, after Jesus told her, Martha, you need to let it go. But few things are needed, he said. Or indeed, only one. You guys are sitting here, what do I do? There is one thing that's needed. Mary has chosen what is better, 
and it will not be taken away from her. What did Mary choose? Mary made a faith decision to place her trust hanging out at the feet of Jesus. God, I'm going to hang out with your word. God, I'm going to hang out with the church on Sunday. I'm going to tune into Tuesday night prayer meeting. I'm going to go to the going deeper Bible study on Friday nights. I'm going to go to my small group. God, I'm going to position myself for your blessing. The problem is too many of you and myself, we're hanging out with the wrong people and we're allowing them to influence us. Stop hanging out with the wrong people and hang out with the right person and hang out with God's family and it will drastically change your life. It will drastically change your life. One thing is needed, position. Man, position yourself at the feet of Jesus and get away from the feet and the crumbs that fall off the table of all these people around you who expect and want you to be perfect. You can never measure up to that. It's an unrealistic expectation. And understand this, perfectionism is a perfect mask for insecurity. Some of us need to get real today. Some of you sitting home on your couch, maybe in your living room, dining room, you need, you need to get real with Jesus today. We need to take off the mask. Jesus, here I am. I'm a sinner. For some of us, a sinner saved by grace. For others, God, I'm a sinner. And I want peace with you, God. I want forgiveness, God. Lord God, I thank you because I know I don't measure up. I know I'm not good enough. I know I'm incapable. I can't solve my own problems. Lord God, if I could fix it, it would be, but yet I'm still broken. I need a touch from heaven. Jesus, I need you right now to stick your hand out of heaven to grab hold of me. I, I need that embrace, Jesus. I, I, need, I need you to tell me it's going to be okay. Lord God, I've spent my life trying to be perfect. I've spent my life trying to keep others happy. Lord God, I know cursed is a man who is loved by many. Cursed is a man who is a people pleaser. I get it. Lord God, I don't want to be cursed anymore. I want to be blessed. Lord God, I'm willing in faith to throw away the, the baggage I've been carrying. I'm willing to leave it along the road and I'm going to take a new direction with you today, Jesus. I'm going to have a merry mentality and I'm going to position myself at the feet of Jesus. I'm going to hang out with you, Lord. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a heart of humility because it's good news. Guys, I was set free. I told you by that realization, I don't have to perform anymore because, man, no matter what I do, I am bought and paid for by Jesus. And he maintains my position in God. Man, there's no more things I can do. I can't do anything else that's going to win me points with God. And if I do less things, I'm not going to lose points with God. My position is secure. What am I working toward? Nothing. You know what I'm going to do instead? I'm going to receive that truth. Jesus, you paid for it. Jesus, you maintain it. I'm going to enjoy life. I'm going to enjoy ministry. I'm going to enjoy people because they have no power over me anymore. And that's what I want to challenge you to do today. It's time for you to get real. Striving for perfection. Guys, it's rejection of grace. Some of you are in need of grace today and you can be made right with God. If you're sitting here today and you're like, man, I want to give up perfectionism. God, I, I don't want to live a life to make others happy. Let me pray with you right now. Father God, in the name of Jesus, as a confession of faith, if that's you, you don't want to be a perfectionist anymore. Just say it in, in your own heart and mind, Jesus, that's me. Jesus, that's me. Lord God, I pray that we would find our security, our hope in the truth of your gospel, Lord God, that we don't have to perform. We don't have to be good enough, Lord, because you are good enough. Lord God, uh, I may be a sinner, but Lord God, I'm a sinner saved by grace. And when I stand before you in judgment, you don't see my sin. You see the blood of Jesus. You see the work of Jesus. Lord God, I'm made right. I am made perfect in you because of Jesus. Lord God, I thank you and receive your grace and mercy today in the name of Jesus. If you're sitting here today and you're like, man, I want to be a child of God. I want that security pastor that you talk about. I want to know that when I die, I'm going to have a, uh, an eternity with God in heaven. I want peace with God. If that's you and you believe Jesus Christ is the son of God who hung your sins on that cross with his body and he paid your debt, your sin debt, if that's you, pray this prayer with me. And the Bible says, if you believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and you confess it with your lips, you will be saved. So if you mean it, you're going to be saved. Let's pray together right now. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I recognize that I have sinned and transgressed against you. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for my sins and rose from the dead. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to enter my heart. Make yourself real to me and change my life. I surrender myself to you right now. 
and I repent of my sins. I turn away from them. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen and amen. Guys, if you made that decision, the Bible shows us that there's a celebration that's happening in heaven and we want to celebrate with you as well. Guys, congratulations on that life-changing decision. The Bible shows us that God guarantees you salvation through Jesus Christ. There is no other bridge. The only way to have peace with God is through Jesus. And many of you have that today. Guys, God bless you. Get off the hamster wheel. Stop pursuing perfectionism and start pursuing the one who is perfect. And his name is Jesus. God bless you guys. See you next week. Hey, what's up? My name is Armando. I'm the pastor of Fusion Church, and we are so excited that you followed along in this message. We hope that you enjoyed this message. If you did, make sure that you hit the like and subscribe button down below. If you feel led by God to support the ministry of Fusion Church, you can do that in a number of ways. Number one, pray for us, pray with us. God is doing some great things here at Fusion Church, and that is probably the best way for you to be part of it. The second way is if you live locally, please come out and visit us. Come, uh, come and enjoy service with us. And if you feel led to, you can even join our team and become a teammate. And the third way is if you feel led by God to give to the ministry of Fusion Church, you can do so by going to our website, www.fusionchurchny.com, and hit the giving tab. With that being said, guys, God bless you. Hope you enjoy the next message.